Brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, it's so wonderful to be together in a real family here. But here we start on the Neosphere. Um, I became involved with Theosophical Society as a teenager when I was 13, 14. I was born in the 1940s, that makes it 54, 55, 56, and uh, met up with uh, Richard Silverstein in 1960. And um, it was a fascinating time, we had lots of discussions, and it was also the time that Thierry de Chardin came out with this wonderful book. He was a Jesuit priest, a paleontologist, and he came out with an amazing book called Phenomenon of Man which, yes, of course, because of his background, had a, a purely Christian setting, but he expanded it in such an amazing way to the cosmos that it was just really touching theosophical principles that I ever grew up with and amazing. So we'll hear some of that. So that's where the name comes from. It really is part of the mental world. Okay, so we'll begin with a debate. And the debate is, is there a separate mental world? Is our thinking simply some epiphenomenon of our brain? Or is there a mental world independent of our thinking? That's, that's really the debate, as I see it. And we can begin with the senses. All life communicates with tremendous amount of senses. There are more sense, senses in animals and plants than there are in humans. We're well aware that animals can communicate things that we are not able to sense. And that includes not just touch, but touch of different, I mean, the touch of skin, the touch of a cloth, the touch of solids is very distinct, and we are able to have senses. And I would like to say here that all of us are very different. We all have different depths of perception, different degrees to which we are sensitized to the degree that I'll end up my talk with talking about clairvoyance, an ability to sense things that most of us are not able to, but some are. So this is not something that's out of the ordinary or unusual, but simply I see it as a, a normal distribution of, of humanity's ability to sense. On the negative side, shall I say, I've met people who sadly don't understand or don't have any feeling for music. I really feel that's a very great pity, because they're missing out on this whole world of music and tone and so on, but there are people who are that way, uh, sadly, uh, dis dysfunctional. So, um, I want us to be aware that we are variously attuned to the world around us. And all of our sensations are transferred to memory. So, in a way, memory is very, very, very important and it creates an internal map we have. Now, is this internal map part of our mental map that we have to navigate. I'll give you some examples. I mean, are such maps physical or mental? Is there a real mental world? Now, dolphins, this is recently, uh, document, this is all well documented, so if you need the references, they're all there. I'll be able to provide you. They're in the notes accompanying. Dolphins can recognize their old friends' whistles after being separated for more than 20 years the longest social memory recorded. I mean, that's at least 20 years. That's not to say they don't remember longer than that, but that's a long time to remember a particular person's whistle in communicating with the dolphin. What about the case of monarch butterflies? What sort of memory do they have? And yet, they're able to travel from <coughs> eastern Canada to fly 3,000 kilometers to, New to Mexico without parental guidance. <laughs> Yet after these, after these insects have wintered in the warmer parts of America, enough of them return each spring to ensure new broods of monarch butterflies from caterpillars on Canadian milkwood plants. Hmm? Is, this, is this the reality of the mental world? I think it is. Memory occurs even in plants. And Neurobiological view sees plants as information processing organisms with rather complex processes of communications occurring throughout individual organisms. And in our um, 
Inter-Pacific Conference just a couple of days ago, we heard how our president, Tim Boyd, talked about trees, and he commented the tree in isolation is really not a real tree. Trees in a forest communicate with each other through the, through the root systems and through the fungal systems and the rhizomorphs associated around the actual roots. And it's been dubbed the wood wide web. So what you have here, uh, as examples of course, when a particular tree is attacked, it sends out pheromones, sends out messages to other trees to know that it's being attacked and produce the right sort of hormones to try and reduce that attack. Or, in fact, to draw in the bugs which will attack the attackers. I mean, it's all recorded, so you can look this up. But I just want you to become aware that trees communicate with each other in, in amazing ways. And all right, so certainly physio biophysiologists agree that the behaviour of uh, behaviors animals, but the sophistication has been masked by the time scale. The plants' responses are very slow in comparison. Yes, there are a few plants which will, you touch them and the leaves just close. Yes, that's unusual. But for the majority of plants, it's much slower reaction, but it's still there. Plants will grow to love you, and some of us have green fingers, and we understand what it is to have some plants which miss out when we go on holidays and we come back in a sorry state and they really love to have us back again. There is a relationship. So that's from plant perception. Now, Jim Tucker in recent times, I know there's been quite a lot written about memories of children and reincarnation and so on. Um, and it takes great courage for a scientist to risk their career to explore anomalous phenomena. And Dr. Ian Stevenson, leading researcher into past life memories of children with the most convincing cases recorded from Asia. But the more recent Jim Tucker, a colleague and author of this book, concentrates on recent cases from Western countries. So it's not just a case of, yes, we have Indian, well, because Indians are brought up, the whole culture is one of reincarnation. There's nothing unusual about it, fine, everybody reincarnates, da 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 da. But in Western countries, this is very, very unusual. And yet it's been specifically detailed by Jim Tucker. So I think it just highlights to me anyway, the, well, the need for more research, certainly, but that there is something more to this memory. And is it a memory of, of a particular individual incarnating, or is it some complex situation? In the case of communication, Goffin's copper twos may not only make and use tools, but they can teach others to do the same. They've been recorded to teach other cockatoos how to do, use an instrument to take that bit of food and so on. So again, this is scientifically recorded about the ability of these particular bird brains, we might call but they're not bird brains, they're, they're very intelligent brains, to actually educate their fellow birds into action. Um, the researchers were very surprised to see that others learned by watching the one cockatoo had first learnt the technique. Now, cross-species communication, I'm sure that you're familiar with quite a lot of these. There are many, many cases around the world where people have communicated with dolphins or communicated with animals that help them to do the fishing, or help them to do the hunting, or help them to interact. In the case of Australia, we have down in the southeastern Eden, a place called Eden, it's Twofold Bay, south, well south of Sydney, in the coast with Victoria. And the, there, the Aboriginal people who were there have a long tradition whereby they used orcas, orca whales, to bring in fish at certain times of the year. There was a cooperation because then they were given some of the food that the Aboriginals cooked or did, prepared or shared. There was a sharing of food. The Orcas got some food and the Aboriginal got some food. It was a cooperation. So, um, you know, and, and there's a, a little photograph here. Fishermen in the waters of Myanmar's river performed a partnership with the waterway Irrawaddy dolphins, which drive fish into the waiting nets. 
Okay. So what sort of what is this sort of communication? If you want to be, you know, try and be so rationalist and physicist and I'm only a non-believing scientist, yet this has to be explained. This is something which is more easily explained by having a mental world, having a telepathy, if you like, or having a contact, having an understanding. And the horse whisperers, of course, and people that are involved with animals, trainers, are very much involved with being able to communicate with animals. There's this amazing story, you may have come across it in a recently in a, on a Facebook, The Elephants Knew. Now, there was a person, Lawrence Anthony, a legend in South Africa, an author of three books, including The Elephant Whisperer. He bravely rescued white life and rehabilitated elephants all over the globe from human atrocities. On March the 7th, 2012, Lawrence Anthony died. Two days after his passing, the wild elephant showed up at his home, led by two large matriarchs. Separate wild herds arrived in droves to say goodbye to their beloved man friend. A total of 31 elephants had patiently walked 12 miles to get to his South African homes, walking slowly for days, making their way in a solemn one by one queue from their habitat to the house. Lawrence's wife, Francoise, was especially touched knowing that the elephants had not been to his house prior for that day for well over three years. But yet they knew where they were going. The elephants obviously wanted to pay their deep respect, honouring their friend who saved their lives. So much respect that they stayed for two days, two nights, without eating anything, and one morning they left and went home. I had the pleasure of meeting this doctor last time, three years ago, and he's here, he was here, I'm not sure that he still practices here in Auckland. Apparently he uh, trained as a medical, a GP. Then he felt it was, he was dissatisfied with just meeting with people for 10 minutes and prescribing aspirin and say, go away. He wanted to be able to be more helpful. So he went to China and he learned acupuncture. He went to uh, Southeast Asia and he learned yoga and he learned the centers and how to apply. And he understood the laying on of hands and psychic healing. And the book is called The Human Aerial. On the right is his figure 13, the healer and the healee in the connected state. He talks about this touching and being able to make a circuit. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We have people in the audience here who practice this. So we'll hear more about this, I'm sure, in the next two days. His interesting comment was a summary, our heart generates a far more powerful magnetic field than our brain. And it is the harmonic connection between our heart and brain that lies at the root of deep healing. So many of us live in our heads, desperately trying to sort things out logically and rationally, but we forget that it's through our hearts that we make the most profound connections. Right. I was very surprised, as I said to you earlier in my introduction to myself, that I was introduced to Théâtre de Chardin and the ideas of the Neusphere. And then I came across this book, the Neusphere, Biosphere Neusphere Reader. I thought, my goodness, global environment, here we go. This is an assemblage of, of articles around the idea of the mental world. But look at the bottom, with a forward by Mikhail Gorbachev. This is Mikhail Gorbachev got to do this here. So I had to get it, so I did. And I realized, and I'll go through with you, what Gorbachev had to do with pulling down the Berlin Wall, of having the nuclear disarmament treaties, and what he has to do with making peace. It's all to do with his concern and understanding of the mental world. <coughs> there we are, three people. Théâtre de Chardin on the left, Leroy on the middle, and Pernatsky, Russian, on the right. The word neosphere was coined in Paris in the 1920s by French scientist, Jesuit priest Pierre de Chardin, <coughs> his compatriot and philosopher, Edward Leroy, and Russian geochemist, Vladimir Vernadsky. By the way, Vernadsky was one that I've come across as a geoscientist, as a planetary scientist, because he certainly was doing the things that I'm doing now, saying we have life throughout space. Space is full of living things. So he was doing that 
among the Russian audience a long time ago. Anyway, the concept was jointly developed by all three of these, but probably coined by Théâtre de Chardin in 1956. The idea of the nursery came to Théâtre when he was non-combatant stretch bearer in the horrors of the trenches of the First World War. However, all three had a place to play in that human potential in science. The other Chardin's description of the new sphere appears to be more spiritual than that of Leroy, underlying a psycho-biological dimension, linking mind and spirituality to the physical nature of living systems. <coughs> in his book, Phenomenal Man, he describes the sphere as a new layer, a thinking layer, which is spread over and above the world of plants and animals. He draws attention to the idea of the emerging global reflexive consciousness, emerging consciousness, evolving consciousness, and thereby we're creating the new sphere. We're, we're part and parcel of being the creation, creator of that, creating a plurality, plurality of individual reflections, grouping themselves together, reinforcing one another in the act of single unanimous reflection. The human phenomenon is seen as a manifestation of the universe unfolding on itself and becoming aware of its own existence, akin to a baby seeing itself in the mirror for the first time. So that's his concept. Very, very interesting, very, I think, theosophical as well. There he is on the left hand side in his um, Jesuit row, Phenomenon of Man, 1959. And um, it was banished by the, while he was alive, it was banned by Roman Catholics to read, by the way. It was so controversial, so extreme, they allowed it to be published. The index. The index. <laughs> but basically what it said, you know, it was really way up there in terms of his vision of the universe and, and the, the mental world and spiritual world. Uh, Vernadsky's ideas were introduced into the process of international negotiations and cooperations by Moiseb, who was a founding member of the Eco Forum for Peace, 1987. Now, this was created with the blessing of Mikhail Gorbachev and brought together not only leading scientists from East and West, but also representatives from the United Nations and NGOs. The stage was widened in Moscow Forum in 1987, quote, a world without nuclear arms, when eminent persons from the humanities also attended, including Graham Greene, Arthur Miller, as well as dissidents, Russian dissidents like Andrei Sakharov, who had exiled himself from Russia at the time. Gorbachev there pointed to the warning that Vernadsky had issued in 1922 predicting that man would master nuclear energy but wondering whether the consequences could be controlled. Later Gorbachev was instrumental in setting up the Green Cross International where he currently serves as president. I'm not sure if that's still current at the moment, but Green Cross International is there. The web page is there for you to see. Through the promotion of global values, global value change as a key to achieving sustainable future for humanity, the Green Cross has created a broad cross-cultural and international network of individuals loosely based on the idea of co-evolving biosphere and newsphere. The organization's board included the late Carl Sagan. Did you know that? Is this new to you? I hope so. This is really widening one's perspective on this whole thing, I think. So Carl Sagan was involved in the board. Others who supported the idea that society will need to embrace these ideas in order to ensure sustainable progress. Very, very important. The metaphysical idea of the noosphere is implied in the term global consciousness that's been amplified through the worldwide networks and so on. And basically, it implies a different concept to the competition of classical Darwinism, rather it's one of cooperation, both practical as in bodies such as UNESCO, and has been viewed as a possible bridge between science and spirituality. Yes, so 
here we have the, the scrap. Now I want to talk about the mathematical man's mindscape. And this is taken from Reed's book, 1994. The mathematical theorist, Ruka, believes that mathematical truths occupy a mental space which he dubs the mindscape. He states that a person who does mathematical research is an explorer of the mindscape in much the same way that Armstrong or Cousteau are explorers of the physical features of our universe. Roger Penrose goes on to say, when mathematicians communicate, it's made possible by each one having a direct route to truth, the consciousness of each being in a position to perceive mathematical truths directly through this process of seeing, seeing the mathematical formula. Have you ever seen this film? If you haven't, please do. Please do. Absolutely stunning, stunning film. Just recently, I saw it just a few months ago. Is it the early 20th century? The Man Who Knew Infinity. The Man Who Knew Infinity. It's about gentleman on the left, Ramanujan, the man of the maths. And. Oh, absolutely, and to begin with. Now, I'm just overlaying it by one of the statements from this brochure, which you can pick up at the film advertising parts, right? It's just a brochure. The mystery behind Ramanujan, the mathematics during his time and his legacy that we enjoy today, all of it is quite frankly mind-boggling. We don't know how he came about his findings, and we are discovering that he imagined his imagined expression, he imagined formulae that would go on to be the very important now in terms of the areas that did not even exist during what, his time when he was alive. It's an incredible story. This is written by a professor of mathematics in Atlanta. Um, I was struck by the film. I was just struck to the core because he was pulled out of Africa, sorry, out of, out of India. He was pulled out of India by uh, an English professor. And um, here, come, I'll look after you. Cambridge, Oxford, in, in, in the UK. And he said, now tell me, how do you do it? He said, I just meditate. I just meditate. I prayed to my goddess. He had a Hindu way of life. He did his pujas, he did his meditations, and he saw the formula. And, and he said, but you can't do this. this is, you've got to explain your steps. Please tell me which way did you get to this formula. So, his first, he was put up for the academy and he failed because they, everybody said, this is nonsense. I mean, yes, all right, you've got wonderful ideas. They really didn't understand his formulae. It was way beyond them. Some of the formula are now being applied to, 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 to quantum theory. So, so eventually then he had another go. And eventually they accepted him. So he became a member of the Academy, uh, an FRS Fellow of the Royal Society. I want to go now to musical mindscape, because to me music and maths are part of the same, part of the brain, part of the same thing. I think <coughs> Richard might be, so might be able to tell us as to where parts it belongs to and so on, but it is, it is there in that other part. It's the part which communicates not rationally and step by step, but, as this will show in the, in the mindscape of the music, it is non-temporal. It's outside of time. When Mozart wrote down his, his little bit I've got here, then my soul is set on fire with inspiration. The work grows, I keep expanding, consuming it more and more clearly until I have the entire composition finished in my head. Then my mind sees it as a glance of my eye, a beautiful picture or a handsome use. It does not come to me successfully, but various parts worked out in detail, but in its entirety that my imagination lets me hear it. There's no time here. It's not before, now, after, so it's not a sequence. It doesn't belong to that part of our brain, that part of our consciousness. It is instantaneous. It is here, now, and everywhere, every when. 
Actually, just a little side thing. When I say every when, this is one thing that my wife, an anthropologist involved with Aboriginal studies, says, this is Aboriginal dream time. Every when. Carl Jung, clearly, I have to touch Carl Jung. Why? Because my thesis is as follows. In addition to our immediate consciousness, which is of a thoroughly personal nature, and which we believe to be the only empirical psyche, there exists a second psychic system of a collective, universal and impersonal nature, which is identical in all individuals. Boy, that should be more theosophical than that. What Jung called the collective unconscious might better be described as a collective knowing of the human species. The imaginal realm of reality is not merely the source of the symbols and archetypes humans have created down the ages. It is the knowing that integrates them into myths, stories, theories, epics, poems, designs, art, patterns. See, not, 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 the, not the logical part, not the sort of deductive part, but the comprehensive part. <coughs> Music of the Mind by Daryl Reamy. If you haven't read it, please do. It's just a wonderful book. He talks about the insights that are enriching and extending those of sacred tradition because the technology it spawned is allowing large numbers of people to enter states of expanded consciousness that have previously been preserved for very few. Another person that I want to draw your attention to is Irvin Laszlo. I've only recently come across Irvin Laszlo, a Hungarian, a polymath. I mean by that, you know, he knows 20 languages and all the maths and all the atomic particles, etc. He's really absolutely amazing. Lives now, I think, in California, in the US. He's come <laughs> up with a few books. And he talks about, well, this particular book, Science in the Akashic Field, an Integral Theory of Everything, published in 2004. And of course, he talks about the Sanskrit word akasha, which is the all-pervasive space, originally radiation. It was considered the most fundamental of all five elements. Akasha, air, fire, water, and earth. Akasha embraces the properties of all five elements. It is a womb from which everything we observe has emerged, and which everything will immediately re ultimately redescend. It's a connecting organism. It's a holographic field. Holographic meaning that if you take one little part, it basically represents the wholeness. The wholeness is in the part, like Mandelbrot, if you like, as well. Um, it transforms a machine-like universe that's blindly groping its way from one phase of its evolution to the next into a whole system universe that builds on the information it has self-generated. The world is more like a living organism than a machine. The world's logic is the logic of life itself. Evolution towards coherence and wholeness through interconnection and interaction. So James Jones, yes, yes. And there are a few others that this talk could be extended with uh, various other people that have played a role in this sort of thing, talking about um, morphic fields, <coughs> Sheldrake, let's see. And uh, Rupert Sheldrake, yes, and there are others, and even my friend, good friend uh, Paul Davies, when he was in Australia, we shared a stage together talking about origins of life and life on Mars and so on. And Paul Davies has for a long time maintained, well, he, Paul Davies himself didn't go as far as Sheldrake goes, but he certainly went as far as saying that life and consciousness must be within the very nature of the very atoms we're made of. Otherwise, we, how does it arise? It must be there. And while I talk about that, I also want to just mention something I'm thinking about lately myself. And that is the contraintuitive one. Yeah. That really the universe is beyond intuition. There are many counterintuitive features about the world. Not to mention one to you. We all know about the half-life. You all heard half-life of uranium in so many thousand years, etc., or half-life of radiocarbon. What determines which atom is going to give up its life? What has the individual atom got to do with it? No, no, statistically, sorry, you will take the statistics. Yes, I understand statistics, 
with individual atoms? Do they communicate with each other? Say, hey, it's your turn to go now. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I, with students, I also I insist on giving. I, you know, a few years I've done five years work with a, a bunch of year ten students in South Australia up in Arkaroola, up in the bush, and showing them rocks and talking about geological time. But also beginning with a pendulum experiment. What is time? We know time very hard to define time. It's probably easiest to define time as. So many beats per second, and so we come to, to, to rhythms and cycles. So many things happen per second or per day or whatever. So that's where time is. And yet, we have a pendulum experiment. And the pendulum experiment, one means a long pendulum will give you one second, about a second, depending on the gravity, because gravity changes, whether you go down to the basement or up to the top of Everest. We did an experiment, I was in first geophysics graduate at Melbourne University with geology and geophysics and so in my geophysics we did pendulum experiment on the bottom floor we went up to the fifth floor of chemistry we did the same experiment different gravity yes because of a different height so yes it varies with the intensity of gravity if you add to the pendulum double its weight nothing happens triple its weight nothing happens <coughs> I believe there's a teacher in the United States who has a big rope hanging from the ceiling of the auditorium and he swings the rope and then he jumps onto the rope and himself swings around and it doesn't change. The, the rhythm doesn't change. This is counterintuitive. I mean, you know, I ask students, just predict, what do you think will happen when I double the weight? Oh, it's going to go slower, it's going to go faster. No, it does not change. That's right. That's right. There we go. Interestingly, Professor John Prescott, he was he just passed away recently at the University of Adelaide. Um, Professor John Prescott, I had lunch with him very often, and I said, John, I'm going up to Arkaroola, I'm going to teach students, and I want a pendulum experiment. Can you give me some formula and just remind me how I should do this? Because I remember something that when I was a student, that was something puzzling to me. He said, Victor. I became a physics professor because I could not believe nature. <laughs> there was something wrong with nature, so I became a physics professor to try and understand why there is this anomaly, why a pendulum experiment does not work the way I think it should or whatever. <laughs> so there we are, it's a very powerful thing. I've given you two examples. There are other examples, of course, and Professor Charles Lineley, who gave a talk recently at Adelaide, he's an astronomer, planetary. He's the one who's made a recent statement, there are more planets than stars in the universe. There are more planets than stars in the universe. Oh, right. That's his statement, prediction. Cosmologist, astronomer. What we found so far is just an icing on the top. So, it's just amazing that we have these sort of things. And he, in his talks, mentioned about the atoms and mentioned about the pendulum experiment and he had a few others. And he talked about the emptiness of the Big Bang, the emptiness of space. And he said, really, it's the absolute fullness. It's a plenum. Everything is ready to happen. <coughs> it's wound down since, you know, entropy and so on takes things down. But essentially, there's no such thing as a vacuum. The vacuum continually creates and disappears particles. So this is kind of the quantum world that we, we, we've now come to understand. Okay, you notice I have a break. Because this part, I would say, is for this audience. And you'll see why. Because I'm going to talk about clairvoyance. I'm going to talk about what people see, those of us who are very sensitive. See angels, devas, and shining beings. This is from the Orthodox faith, which I've grown up in, Russian Orthodox. And this is some of the images, some of the icons with angels participating very much in this act. We even have Muhammad. Now you know that Muhammad is forbidden to be displayed in certain <coughs> sect, major sects of Islam. Uh, but in this case, this is from Persia, I understand, and they were allowed to have the 
The horse and Muhammad himself are surrounded by angels. Of course, we have Satyaketa, born among Devas in the Hindu faith. And there are many others, of course, with Devas. Every religion, this is words by Geoffrey Hodson, who belongs here in New Zealand very much. Some of us, I think, are sleeping in his quarters here, <laughs> upstairs. Every religion has its angels and archangels, legends, myths, and folklore of every country throughout the world, and in all ages, speak of angels and nature spirits, spirits of mountains, of clouds, rivers, mischievous imps, etc. Yet very specific, very little specific information is available about them or their functions and activities. I have the great honour and pleasure of having one-to-one -one discussion with Jeffrey Hodson years ago, uh, well before he died, and I had great respect, and he was then working with David Linus, Professor Linus of, in Queensland, on trying to see, using his abilities to perceive the fragments of ancient humanoid ancestors from South Africa, the diggings from the archaeological digs that South Africans have come up with, and saying, well, these were human type, there was a relationship there to human type, this were not, these were more primitive or ape-like. And this sort of discussion apparently has been now written up, and, and we're waiting for some publication of this. The letters involved with this, and the discussions on, on Geoffrey Hodson's work, clairvoyant work, with scientists, testing out his ability to see with, and helping them in turn, helping the archaeologists in turn to determine whether some of the diggings in South Africa were related to our ancestors more directly, uh, intelligent humans rather than ape-like, less intelligent. But the Kingdom of the Gods is based on knowledge revealed in occult books like The Secret Doctrine, H.P. Blavatsky, Clairvoyant Investigations, and Ibiza <coughs> Ledbeater, and Jeffrey himself. As to the proof of their existence of these invisible beings, the author points out that while there can be no demonstrable proof of the fruits of mystical experience, tests by personal research is possible. And Jeffrey says that the test I have attempted to apply and this book is in part a record of my own findings. So that's up to him. I mean, you know, there are many people who have the ability, as I said, on the fringes of our humanity, there are some people with very sensitive ability of sensing, and they're able to present us with this case. I think this is a case of the mental world. Or is it the mental world? Well, I think it may be, because if we if we go to I, don't, I think I'm wrong here. It's not H.P. Blavatsky, it may be um, Generator Dasa who made this diagram. It's based on Blavatsky's comments. On the left hand side of the evolution of life, we have mineral, elemental life, mineral life, and then the water goes through the watery worlds and into birds and eventually into devas and dying chokers. On the right hand side is our own mammals, reptiles, mammals and then humans, and then adepts, and so on. So this is an indication that that uh, historical study has suggested that there probably is a separate line of evolution, one leading to this mental world of pattern, of, of the mathematical, the musical, the artistic, the, because art is part of the creativity, and the other one, the one we've gone along the track of, the logical, the methodical, the scientific, the technological, etc. way. So, we have them. Of course, the paintings were done not by Jeffrey Hodson or by any peasant or a bit. They were done by artists at the instruction of the people who were seeing. So there is a translation. There is a difference in, you know, specifically what you see. And of course, what they describe, the people who see, describe these as vibrant things. They're not something just still and painted on. They are, they are radiating, they're shimmering. But they describe these as auras that are very vibrant, very shimmering, very much alive and changing all the time as the, as the person changes. Or the music on the right-hand side, the music of Gounod, 
according to Annie Besant and Leadbeat in thought forms. You know, some dramatic music and some dramatic art forms, some dramatic images result from that. And of course we have, within our system of understanding, that in fact we are made up of a human constitution has a physical body, we have the emotional selves, we have the karmanas, we have the mental and emotional parts, we have the lower and then the upper mental, the more spiritual part, the abstract, which leads eventually into the causal body, the body of, of, of identity of what is the soul, what is ourselves and so forth, and the centers. And I was struck just recently, well, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we visited France and we visited Portugal, and among the places we visited was Fatima, a place where millions and millions of devotees gathered together. And I was struck by the, well, the intensity of devotion of people. There weren't those crowds when we were there, there were only a few, it was pouring rain. Um, but basically the story is one of tremendous healing, and one as a scientist, I've understood the ability of the power of thought and placebos. You understand what placebos mm. are? If we believe enough in something, it work. If a person that's treating us wears a white coat, that already helps. If they've got a degree up in them, that helps. If, by the way, red pills, I think, work better than blue pills. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but there's some psychological thing. They've tested this out. Placebos with red work better than placebos with green. You know. And, and similarly, so a placebo effect is reality. So maybe these are just healings occur. But the power of people's thought together, when you have thousands of people, and you come through that and, you, and you, you, you're healed, possibly through your own system. Now, Richard might be able to tell us something more about the ability of the human mind to generate the pheromones, the hormones, sorry, the, 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 the essences within ourselves to heal ourselves. Because well, I certainly know that we, if we are positive and optimistic, we're really on the way to being healed. In contrast, if we say, look, I'm going to die tomorrow, and well, you know, you're going to create an image where you're going to die tomorrow. Well, you know, you're already negative, negative, negative. On the other hand, if you become positive, if you are helpful to yourself, if you're optimistic about it, then the brain will create the necessary chemicals to help you to self-heal. Which is nothing. Um, I just wanted to show you the Black Madonna from Poland on the left, and then the Mother of the World, Nicholas Rarick painting, again with this amazing image of that is uh, well in the mental world and the spiritual world. I have a blank because I've come to the end of my lecture. So <laughs> for one slide, and please don't laugh at me. Too <laughs> <laughs> <Be> late. <laughs> because. I'm going to suggest to you, I've got a question, is this also, is this also a case of the mental world? I think it is. I think it is. Whilst it's very hard to prove the existence of UFOs, except that NASA scientists have told me, yes they exist, yes they are real, but we can't possibly research them because we'll never get grants from the US taxation. The tax appraisal department to in, well involve ourselves in UFOs. It just won't be done. But these are realistic. These are things that can be photographed, can be measured, can be recorded, and so forth. So it's much more easy to record this phenomena. I'm just saying this is a phenomena we have to describe. If we're going to be scientists, if we're going to be involved with nature. So basically, here it is. This is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. And there's much more that can be added. And we'll have much more in the next two days. Thank you.